Alrighty, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, Beer School, the virtual edition. Um, you guys are watching these videos like crazy, and uh, we appreciate that. I had no idea that I would you know, put me on video uh, talking mindlessly about beer for 15 or 20 minutes, and you guys would actually want to watch this stuff. It even blows my mind more that you guys are willing to come in and pick up great beers uh, and sip on them while we're, uh, or drink them, uh, or guzzle them, while we're actually going through the, 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 the narrative. Um, but I want to thank every one of you guys for doing that, and I hope it brings some sense of normalcy, some sense of calm, some sort of uh, appreciation about beer uh, through this whole crazy uh, Kobe thing that we're going through. Um, today we're going to get into Pale L's, and this is actually the introduction uh, class to a series of classes we're going to be doing over the next month or so, uh, dealing with hoppy beers in general. So if you like IPAs, Session IPAs, Locale IPAs, Hazy IPAs, Imperial IPAs, uh, this is going to be a good month for you. If you don't like hops, this is going to be a terrible month for you. Because uh, we're going to really focus on uh, the hoppy versions of American beers uh, starting today and going the course of the next four or five, maybe even six weeks. We'll just see where it, that all goes. But a great introduction uh, to what American L and American hoppy L's mean to us is basically starting with the Pale L, the American classic Pale L. The Pale L has been around for a very long time. Americans actually borrowed um, the, the, the basics and the fundamentals of the Pale Ale from England. They were into making Pale Ales long before America was, uh, had come along. Um, and their beers, those Pale Ales from England, uh, had this kind of a, a maltier, nuttier kind of cinnamon than, than the Pale Ales that we drink today do. Um, the British really had prized themselves on having equal parts hop flavored and equal parts um, malt flavored. So they liked a really well-balanced beer. They would get a lot of their extra character from their yeast. Their yeast that they would ferment with in, in Great Britain uh, had a lot of nuances of fruit, had some nuances of um, uh, sort of a little bit more um, cashew flavors that it brought from the malt and, and brought in, and uh, let the yeast kind of develop those a little bit further. So they had a lot more character that they could work with there. Um, our American ale yeast doesn't have that fine amount of character, so we'll see that narrative change as we go through some of these beers. But those original ones, when the colonial Americans settled on the uh, East Coast, um, they brought with them that heritage of pale ale, and they tried to make pale ales the way that they made them in England. However, the grains that were suitable in the New England area uh, was not great. Uh, they were very spindly grains, they did not have a lot of starch. So you could not get a lot of sugar from them. So the yeast had a hard time fermenting those beers and giving them pleasant flavors. They really did like that balance they got. There were hops actually growing in New England, and but they weren't the hops you wanted. They were very grassy, very stemmy, very vegetal in general, and they just did not prefer that. So once the American colonies got established, they would bring ingredients from Great Britain and they would make Great Britain style like uh, Pale uh, in America uh, until that become cost prohibitive. Now, the flavors changed quite a bit as, um, America starts spreading out, and eventually during the gold rush, whenever they, the, the settlers move out west, uh, they pick up ingredients along the way, and they make beers and let them ferment kind of on the way, but they would make beers out of the very stemmy, the corns, uh, the, some of the barley they would find, maybe some wheat, and it's just never great flavors, but they would drink it anyhow because it was a beer of necessity, not necessarily, necessarily indulgence. Uh, but those beers would build up pressure inside those kegs to the point where when they you know, debunked them, uh, they would make this hissing sound and it'd roll off the, out that bung like steam. And so they call those the steam beer, eventually known as California Common Ale. Those are then kind of the, the, the forerunners to the American Pale Ale. Now, once we learn how to cultivate the proper kind of grains, kind of like English grains, but with an American uh, attitude because of our new terroir, the new sun angles, the new soil, uh, the new moisture, um, the grains change a little bit and become the American two row uh, barley. And so that's become prized for most Americans whenever they make things like Pale Ales. So some of the earlier ones um, started, or I'm sorry, some of the, the, the beers that kind of rolled off of that steam ale attitude were the American Pale Ale. And Sierra Nevada in the 80s really made their uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale extremely famous. Uh, that held true for a very long time. The reason why that was very famous is because finally they could make an American Pale Ale with American ingredients, American barley, American hops, those Pacific Northwest hops. They're really prized for their kind of resinous bitterness, uh, but also their grapefruit character, their strong citrus attributes. Uh, so you had a lot of unique flavors, and so the people on the West Coast really felt fond of that. Um, but the balance started shifting at that moment and started becoming something a little bit more hop-driven than malt-driven. Now, we're not looking at complete hop dominance at this point because we're talking about a pale ale and not an IPA. Uh, but the pale ale started taking this attitude where we're going to let the hops elevate slightly above the malt. 
we're gonna let the malt dry out just slightly while we're still retaining a sense of really great balance, but we notice that the palate shift has started at that point. So the first three beers we're gonna be talking about really hinges on that very popular classic American Pale Ale. And the last three beers we're gonna be talking about is gonna be the new Pale Ale and kind of how things have built, developed from that. When I say new Pale Ale, you would just assume, well, we just abandoned the old thing and just start picking up all the new things. But that's not true. Some of the older Pale Ales are still very, very popular. And even though the, the, the Pale Ale style has taken some twists and turns along the way, uh, the last 10 years have showed some sort of development, but the classic ones are classic for a reason and they're not going away anytime soon. Brooklyn Brewery makes a really good classic pale ale that's a little bit more of that British style. So if you really wanted to see what we're talking about when we're talking about British ales, and if you don't have access to the British pale ale, uh, the Brooklyn Brewery does a pretty nice job. Their base yeast they use in most of their beer styles is going to be an English variety of yeast. So you do get some of those nuances of peach, nectarine, apricot, almost a jammy kind of fruitiness that comes from a beer, even though this is not a thick, sweet, or heavy beer at all. You do get some of those elements of jamminess that I really like and that comes from the English uh, yeast. So you get to see that narrative play out in the Brooklyn Summer Ale. Uh, Summer Ale for a reason. It's very light, very crisp, very refreshing. And even though we can talk about some of the stronger uh, yeast flavors, uh, stronger malt flavors, we're really talking about our extremely crisp and refreshing beer. Uh, this has been a beer that's been out for, uh, I, I know, 10, 15 years. Uh, maybe even longer than that, uh, but it's a stalwart. People really come in in the summertime and they buy a lot of this Brooklyn uh, Summer Ale. And at $1.89, it's a very affordable can. All the beers we're gonna be talking about today are gonna be very affordable. These do not come from overseas. You do not, do not pay those excise taxes. You don't pay for an extra importer to handle the beer before it gets to us. So all the beers today come from America, so the, the, the cost on these beers will be very cheap today. One of the breweries that really started exacerbating that classic American Pale Ale style is Oscar Blues. And so their uh, Dell's Pale Ale, uh, very stalwart uh, kind of Pale Ale, been around this market for quite some time, even in the Denver area and out west. This beer's been a fan favorite for an extremely long time. Uh, kind of a little bit more elevated malt characteristic, but the hops still shine. The hop uh, flavors on this are a little bit on the stronger side without becoming an IPA. So you do get those equal parts uh, hops, equal parts um, malts playing out in this beer but it has this fresh crisp character as well but it's a little bit more fuller uh, than the uh, brooklyn ale and three floyds uh, from near chicago right outside of there in indiana um, are really known for the hoppy beers if you're watching this it means you're probably into the beer scene if you're into the beer scene you know what three floyds is all about An extremely good brewery uh, and they do hang their hat on their hoppier style so if they're going to make an ipa it's also going to exhibit a really firm hop dominance uh, over top of the malt, even though we can still talk about balance. So when, when we talk about the balance of the malt in some of these beers, especially this one, it gets a little bit on the toastier side. It gets a little bit more on the deeply caramelized side without becoming toffee-like or too sweet. Uh, there's some bread crust components that come out of this from the malts, and it gives the beer just a little bit more heft, a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, aggressiveness whenever it comes to the toasted side of the malts. And it really does a nice job playing off those strong citrusy, grapefruit, orange peel, uh, characteristics of the hops here, and that they let the hops kind of go up an elevated way too. And that's just a, um, a result of the palate shift that we go through whenever we eat things or drink things. If we see something that we like, then obviously we want more of it. And so the American Pale Ale over time has tried to become a little bit more IPA-like as people's palate preferences start shifting from the Pale Ale to the IPA. And so within the last decade that the beer trap has been open, I've seen that shift uh, play out in front of us. And so I really like what I've seen. At one point, the IPA becomes so dominant and uh, so, um, uh, I guess, preferred over top of the Pale Ale. At one point, I thought the beers like the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, the Dells, the Brooklyn, the Three Floyds, was a dead style. I thought it was going to go extinct because the preference was so heavily placed on the IPA. Uh, however, the IPA has responded, or the Pale Ale has responded in a very big way. And what brewers have recognized very quickly was people do want more hop characteristic, but they don't necessarily want more hop bitterness. So brewers are putting a lot more emphasis on late stage hopping. And we'll get into that kind of, those kind of techniques later on as we get through these hoppy beer schools. One of the beers that really changed the game, Zombie Dust. And so Zombie Dust uh, was the first beer um, where the brewery, Three Floyds, had exclusive rights to Citra Hops. Citra hops is one of those new wave variety of hops uh, that have an extremely strong aromatic quality, extremely strong flavor quality, but the bitterness on them starts to back away a little bit. No more of that sharp, piney, resinous bitterness in the back of the throat. You get a softer, sprucey, cedar-like, or sometimes even more of a hemp-like, vegetal, herbal kind of bitterness. Uh, become a little bit on the peppery side. 
uh, that seems to have a little bit softer uh, mouthfeel component or a, a, it doesn't have the grip on the throat uh, and the strong bitter linger that uh, some of the previous hops do. Um, so the citra hops, you know, as the name implies, has a very strong citrus quality with the tangerine flavors, some red grapefruit, even gets into some mango qualities uh, as the beer warms up and as it kind of ages out a little bit. The problem with citra hops, extremely delicate. They oxidize very, very quickly and they fade very, very quickly. So if you see a beer that celebrates the citra hop characteristic, it's gonna be wonderful if you can find it fresh. So get it fresh, drink it soon, do not age these. Uh, but Zombie Dust is one of the forerunners the source that we'll give people more hop flavor. We're going to back away from that sweetness and that toasted characteristic a little bit because we do want the hops to shine, but we don't want to be a bitter beer like an IPA. We just want to celebrate the hop flavor and keep the, uh, the mouthfeel medium, keep the uh, sweetness level medium, and without letting everything run too much. These are not very aggressive beers at all, even though we're letting the hops shine a little bit more. When you think about hops, you got to think about it as a three-headed monster. We get the hop aroma, you get the hop flavor, and then you get the hop bitterness. And all three of those things can be very separate. Just because you have one does not mean that you have all three, or it doesn't even mean that you have to have any of those others. You can really do a really nice job with hops without becoming excessively bitter, and that's what the, these Pell Ls have done. Guayabara by Cigar City does the exact same thing. It's an all citra Pell L. A little bit lighter than the zombie dust. Less caramel sweetness, has almost like this cracker-like honeysuckle characteristic from the malts. Uh, but it has that same tangerine orange peel uh, characteristic. It starts to bleed into this grassy territory. Uh, the finish might remind you uh, a little bit of geranium or um, chive or maybe even hemp. Uh, some people like that sort of thing. Then we close up today with uh, the DJ Roomba. This is a series of Pell Ls that Mawad Brewing Company makes. And you see different words on each one of these releases. And this was made exclusively with Samba Hops. Samba Hop is a new hop variety. And whenever I drink this beer uh, a couple weeks ago, this is my first experience with Samba Hops. It's really prized for its uh, stone fruit characteristic and it's very soft tea-like bitterness. Uh, I get all that, but also get this verbena, lemon-like characteristic, some elements of cedar in the finish. Uh, it's a really neat hop variety. Um, Wild Wild has used this in a single hop variety, which is a great way to kind of learn and educate yourself about the hops. But I think this hop needs a little bit of help maybe from a conjunction with another hop variety or two. But the Samba Hops, I think, is the hop variety that's really uh, kind of stand out because it's, um, you know, tangy, almost an underripe, uh, under orange characteristic, uh, lemon characteristics, uh, along with some stone fruits and peach, apricot maybe. Don't, don't be surprised if you find elements of that as the beer starts to warm. Got some guys outside waving in here. Hey guys. Um, so that wraps up beer school for today. And um, like I said, as we go along um, the next couple of weeks, we're gonna learn a lot more about hops. Uh, next week, we're actually gonna jump into IPA territory, American IPA. And we're gonna look a little bit more of how uh, bitter, bitterness is measured. And a lot of times you say bitterness, well, is that low bitterness, high bitterness? Well, there's mechanisms in place to ensure that you're getting the right kind of bitterness for the balance of the beer. Every beer style has its own definition of bitterness so, uh, or balance, so it depends on what kind of style you're talking about is how we're going to describe uh, balance. And uh, bitterness is a great way to kind of measure that, especially in American hoppy beer. So we're going to talk more about that and how it plays a big role and whether you like the beer or not. Uh, before I let you go, we're going to go through some key points. These beers usually dance around 5 or 6% alcohol. Rarely do you see one that's very low, but rarely do you see one that's very strong. These are meant for crisp, clean refreshment, very enjoyable. Um, and because they are have that refreshing uh, quality, we really like to drink these maybe a, a touch lower on the scale, around 40 degrees. You don't want to do it too cold because you don't want to numb those taste buds, but you do want it cold enough to uh, kind of bring out the beer's more refreshing qualities. Uh, you don't want to get too cold because then you won't appreciate those malts nuances. You won't be able to appreciate the, the celebration of the hops in the proper kind of way. Uh, so you want to make sure you're doing the beer justice at the proper temperature. Um, you can pair these with a lot of varieties of, of foods, uh, very versatile uh, foods whenever it comes to the Pale Ls. Uh, cheeses, go with a, a cheddar cheese, even a sharp cheddar can, can, can survive pretty well with these. Your American cheddar do real well. Go to Wisconsin, eat all the cheese, take some of these Pale Ls with you, you'll enjoy it immensely. Uh, entrees, you just you can't beat a classic American pepperoni pizza and a Pale Ale. Those two is just a marriage made in heaven. You can go almost any direction you want to when it comes to American food. You can go hot dogs, hamburgers, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's a Pale Ale out there for American cuisine, no doubt about it. Uh, desserts, I can see going a little bit di different directions. If you want to do the classic Pale Ales, 
and uh, you want to really emphasize that malt characteristic that the, the classic ones have, uh, go with something like a pecan pie. Go with something a little bit more like a carrot cake. Those are actually kind of good flavors. But if you go with the newer varieties of IPAs, you want to celebrate the hop characteristic a little bit more because these beers already have that grapefruit, that tangerine kind of characteristic. Go with like a key lime pie. Go with something that's fruity also, citrusy also, but a different citrus fruit. You're not mimicking the citrus fruits. You're complementing the citrus qualities in the beer with the citrus quality of the pie. So I find that those uh, links work out pretty well and they help to create uh, a, a sense of balance. And you know, one thing I love about beer and food pairings is the food always tells part of the story, but it never completes the story. Beer has the ability to complete that story. So what's it doing to fill the holes that the entree hasn't already said? So that's a fun game to play. Uh, if you're worried about beer and food pairings, don't worry about it too much. In wine and food pairings, I find that if you pick the wrong wine, it can destroy the flavors. They can really interfere with each other in an extremely negative way. So you gotta be careful when you're pairing wine with food. When it comes to beer with food, that risk of destroying the, 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 the session is, is really, really low. I've not found a whole lot of uh, pairings where I feel like the, the beer ruined the dish and the dish ruined the beer. That just doesn't happen. Beer is much more forgiving. And I think that's because so many of the ingredients in beer links up with ingredients in food. So you got that going for you. So play around with these kind of foods, play around with these kind of beers. And when we put this beer school together, this entire beer school costs you about $15. So you can actually afford to play around a little bit more. So if you're interested in playing along, watching these videos and drinking the beers as we go along, let us know. We get the word out around Tuesday, um, around five or six o'clock about what the beer school is going to be. So throughout the week, if you want us to put together the collection of beers that we highlight in, in uh, these uh, videos, then we're happy to do that. We can have them ready for you. You can come and pick them up whenever you like throughout the week. We thank you very much and we'll see you next week for IPAs.